Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to see friends. Pat Zollner, who talked me into presenting this this morning, uh, Karen Chang, uh, Susan Hambrish, and Donna Lee, and, and the rest of you. I think it's appropriate to start today really focusing on how, how cyber infrastructure impacts the way we teach at the undergraduate level here at Purdue. Um, because there are, of course, implications for the broader impact for any type of proposal that Purdue investigators submit, at least to NSFs. Uh, I am a former program director at National Science Foundation, the Division of Undergraduate Reg Education. And I think it's very clear that as cyber infrastructure changes the way we work in the world, there are also implications for the way in which we might change our interactions with students, the way students interact with each other, and the way we as faculty approach our task of educating our students. So I'm going to present this morning about some old technology which is a survivor. And I think here at Purdue we've had the opportunity to jump into this surviving technology and think about ways in which we could make it new. And I'll present uh, how using this tool changes the way in which my students work together and how faculty work together. I'll also share some uh, comments from our uh, users group about why this technology has survived and what it is that makes this so important. And finally, uh, end with some ideas about how this could advance the research and publication of our faculty here at Purdue. So the tool I've been using is called Calibrated Peer Review, CPR. I'm a physiologist, and when I use the acronym CPR with physiology, they didn't like it very much. So I've called it problem-based writing with peer review. And here's a, a, a word soup showing the kinds of things that we're doing with calibrated peer review. It's very uh, much linking faculty to students through research in the context of biology. And we did get some funding from the National Science Foundation. Uh, principal investigators, I'm working with Ellen Gunlack of Statistics. I wanted to teach biology better Ellen wanted to teach statistics better, and we realized that we could do that better together than we could independently. I needed my biology students to understand the statistics, and she needed a better biological context for what she was teaching in the stats courses. So we got some money to use this technology in large enrollment uh, courses. I have 300 student lectures. She has many sections, uh, which total 900 undergraduate students in a stats course. And the, the um, tenets of CPR is to engage our students with expository writing. And that would actually show us how clearly they're thinking about our subject matter. And then to engage them with peer review, looking at each other's writing so that we can actually manage the writing task in these large enrollment classes. Um, and so we're not teaching them to write. We're actually teaching them with writing. And so we agreed that both the writing and the learning about our subject matter were going to be important for the assignments we came up with. And here's, here's something I think that we should all be paying attention to. Uh, I learned about calibrated peer review at a previous position in California, and it's been recognized by Merlo. Uh, Merlo is one of those online res uh, resources where faculty from community college, four-year college, they vote on the best educational resources. So I think we should be paying attention, not just to what's happening at Research One institutions, but to how what we do and how we change what we do impacts people at other institutions. So this is just proof that CPR is surviving and, and really popular technology. It got a five-star rating by Merlo. It's also been chosen uh, by PCAL, Project, Project Kaleidoscope, as one of their pedagogies of engagement. And if you want to know more details than I can give you this morning, uh, go to the PCAL Pedagogies of Engagement website. So it was really um, known to be effective, and here's the way it works. There are basically several phases. The first phase is I write an assignment and my students submit their essay, a short essay, maybe 500 words. And then I get the opportunity as an instructor to show them what I think a really outstanding essay looks like. And I also show them some of the typical flaws that I want to teach them to avoid. So I'm teaching them not only what a good essay is, but what a poor essay uh, is that they should recognize. And then they um, review my calibration essays, and based on whether they can distinguish the really good ones from the typical flaws, their scores are weighted more or less when they peer review each other's work. And so the final phase, after they peer review other students' work, is they look back at their own work, and then they have this scale uh, to locate their own work from the high quality to the typical examples of flaws. 
And so in the end, um, they get feedback from the system, they get feedback from the peers, and the arrow that goes off the bottom is they're able to come back to me and talk to me about the whole process. But I no longer have to talk to 300 students about their essay, and now I typically talk to maybe 20. So peer review is what we do as scientists. It's an essential skill of all professionals, and yet we rarely teach it. And we found this to be useful in large and small enrollment classes. Here's what the students say. I think this is really exciting. Um, each assignment makes me iron out my writing. Th this is the stuff that we want to be doing. It made me read the material and make sense of it. It allows me to explain the same topic as others and get other views on the same topic. So students recognize that this is making them do the types of things that we really want our students to be practicing. Uh, so in addition, calibrated peer review ha has a mechanism for faculty to share good assignments. So I'm really excited that here at Purdue, Pat, among others, have written some assignments and we can go in there and I can take Pat's assignments and tweak it and make it work for my own students. Um, here's one, for example. The faculty who write the assignments also get credit for it. So here's an assignment that was written by Arlene Russell at UCLA and Barbara Gonzalez at Cal State Fullerton. Anybody who wants to go in and teach students to write about significant figures can borrow and adapt this assignment to your own purposes. So the interface then for faculty, you can manage your assignments, you can manage your students. Um, you can search, so if, for example, I, I know that Ellen's assignments are great, so I might be watching what she's doing. Um, I know Pat has some interesting things going on, so I can look at what he's doing. And uh, it actually personalizes the process of sharing our pedagogical tools. And once you then access and set up an assignment, you can tweak all of these different aspects. You can tweak the source materials you ask the students to look at. Um, you can tweak the kinds of guidelines I would give for my first year students. They probably need more detail than someone in a, in a more advanced class. I can change the calibration essays. If my students have a different type of typical flawed thinking than others, I can put that into the calibrations. So this isn't just a gee whiz tool. I think the reason this is successful is that it's grounded in both theory and the practice. And so in talking among our user group, we realized that our experienced, innovative faculty who are using this are doing things that they were already trying to do, but the workload was unmanageable. So it makes their work more efficient. And junior faculty are really interested in getting to know more about their students. So this allows them to look at their students' writing and to find out what strikes a chord, what it is that students are interested in. And, uh, it, what's very, really unusual about CPR is reading students' essays, you get a feel for what they're struggling with. So you can diagnose the way in which they're thinking in a way that allows you to then do preventative remediation. Um, and finally, CPR promotes the scholarship of teaching and learning. You get this rich data set of the students' actually, actual writing in digital format, and that's good material for publishing papers. So this one uh, I published back in 2002, you can see how old the technology is, showing that when students wrote about what they were learning in physiology, they scored a letter grade higher on average. And then recently, um, Ellen and I with Carrie Clays, who's in the College of Technology, here we are collaborating across three different courses, came up with a quick way to get information from students about whether our assi assignments were on target or not. So there's a lot of potential for sharing across many different uh, subject matter. So acknowledgements, I really would like to acknowledge ITAP that made it possible for us to use CPR because they took this old technology and they put the CAS authentication, making it easier for our students to log into the system, which reduced the number of complaints we were getting from the students. And I think there's great p potential for ITAP to continue to collaborate with UCLA and update this tool uh, if we can maintain good communication, which they're doing really well so far. And so this was a small amount of funding from National Science Foundation, but with this groundwork, I think we've collected the type of data that can lead to bigger projects. It's also been funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and of course, the University of California um, Office of the President. It won the 2006 Brian P. Copenhaver Award from the American Chemical Society. Truly meritorious. Uh, software, cyber infrastructure that changes the way we work with our students 
and I'm really glad that Purdue has been involved in this project. Um, so I'm not sure if there are time for questions now or later. Okay, so thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Appreciate you braving the cold weather and, and being here this morning. Uh, when I was asked to talk about hot seat, I debated and debated about the approach to take, and I thought what, I, what may work best, because hot seat is so versatile, it can be used by uh, different disciplines in different ways, depending on the size of your, your classroom, depending on your resources available, how many TAs you have. It can be used in a variety of ways. And so since we only had about 10 minutes in which to uh, share our story with you, I decided to basically take that tactic. You're all very intelligent, creative people. I figured if I told you my story, you then in turn could interpret that and perhaps utilize a tool like Hot Seat that best fits your discipline and the resources you've got. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, I teach very, very large lecture classes. I have one class that typically runs about 450 students a semester. I have another one uh, that's almost that size, depending on whether it's scheduled at 7.30 in the morning or not. If it's 7.30 in the morning, there's far fewer students involved. But typically, I have these large classes. And the topics have to do with lifespan, human development, and marriage and family. And so much of what we want to look at, investigate, look at the research and literature, but also find out from students what their perspective are, what their views are, what their values are, involve topics such as same-sex marriage, uh, gender identification, sexuality, topics like that. And I'm sure most of you realize that in large lecture classes, let alone if they're introductory classes, you cannot get a freshman, brand new, at Purdue student to talk about sexuality in front of 350 people that they don't even know. So I struggled with how to get students involved in discussion, finding out what they know, finding out what they believe and what they think, and Hot Seat provided me with a tremendous tool to be able to do that. So what I've done is I've actually gone in and lifted out a few of uh, the ways I use Hot Seat. And so, for instance, one way in which I use Hot Seat has to do with addressing topics that, that may be somewhat touchy, somewhat controversial. And I'm going to show you here a, a screenshot of one of the Hot Seat conversations in which we were looking at sexuality, we were looking at how do you define when a person has sexual intercourse or not. You know, we had a president of the United States that didn't think he had sex with Monica Lewinsky. And so when you couple that with the fact that sexually transmissible diseases among adolescents is rampant, and much of it is spread through oral sex. So this was part of the discussion we were, we were getting into. When, when is a person really having sex, and when is it not sex? And, and so I actually posted a topic having to do with, well, define intercourse for me. Define virginity for me. Define sexuality. When are you having sex, and when are you not having sex? And so this was a question I posted for students um, in which they responded to what they thought uh, was sexual intercourse, what was sexual contact, what wasn't. Another example um, of a touchy subject uh, has to do with cohabitation. Uh, cohabitation is becoming a new lifestyle in our society. And I wanted to ask our Midwestern uh, students a little bit about their values and would you do it or would you not do it and explain why and think about and talk about that and one of the advantages of the hot seat you can actually take the discussion and turning into a kind of a polling or voting finding out what the distribution is uh, on their opinions and ideas and you can actually end up uh, using that as part of your discussion in class. The other thing I found that students will do uh, which is very, very interesting, they will talk to one another during class on hot seat. So each one of these topics, they can reply to one another, and actually a student in the front row can be conversing with everybody in the class, responding to a student's in the back row's comment that's up on the screen. And uh, if you so choose, you could actually bring that into what you're doing in the classroom. But it's almost like they can talk to one another during class while you're lecturing or while you're discussing or whatever you're covering. Another example uh, relating to same-sex marriage, and again, you can use the voting function and ask them 
are they in favor of or are they not in favor of? You can ask them the reasons why and they can explain and et cetera. Uh, you can use hot seat to bring a little levity to the classroom. This particular class, uh, we were talking about dating uh, and we were looking at what, what, what personally attracts you to maybe a potential romantic partner. And so I asked them to give me their best pickup lines. And so these were some of the ones they turned in. Um, yeah, how much milk do you drink? The best, the best one out of this bunch uh, was, uh, uh, did it hurt when you fell from heaven? Did it hurt when you fell from heaven? So. But you can add a little levity to the classroom. You can get that involved. The bottom line, hot seat enables you to engage, engage your students. They're going to multitask you no matter what, right? The, by utilizing hot seat, you can get them multitasking you and what you want them to do in the classroom if they're going to multitask. So that's one of the really, really powerful ways in which a hot seat can be used. Another way in which you could use hot seat, you can use it for case studies. You can present them a case study and ask them to solve or make a comment or come up with a decision relating to a case study. This had to do with a case study relating to sexting, where students take, for instance, pictures, nude pictures, and send them to other people via the internet. And um, this was a court case that came up in Pennsylvania where uh, some teenagers are actually uh, going to be going to court, maybe going to prison over. Um, sexting a picture of, a, of one of their peers. You can use it for voting. I've already showed you an example of that. In this particular case, uh, two major theorists in, in um, uh, cognitive development relating to Vygotsky or Piaget, and I simply asked them to vote which ones they felt they most uh, felt most comfortable with and most appealed to them. Again, I have some research that was done by Silverman and Grunbaum, and I asked them basically to respond to the question, uh, is love required uh, as a basis for marriage? So in a class of 450 students, uh, typically I will get uh, 160, um, maybe even 200 by the end of the day comments um, available to them. Now, some research that ITAP did, uh, the two courses here are my two courses, and this was another course on personal finance. I wanted to put this up because they found the usage of hot seat greatly increases if you use it by design. If it's just a matter of conversation, if it's just a matter of, of discussion in class, uh, students don't tend to use it. But if you actually make it part of what's happening and why and the theme for the day and some of those things, uh, students tend to participate in it much more. The other thing I learned, uh, kind of a side note, the first semester I used it, I did a little bit of experiment. First eight weeks, uh, I just asked students to comment, to post, to discuss. And I was very disappointed with the response. Second eight weeks of the semester, I said, I will give you a, a small amount of extra credit for posting. So out of 1,200 points, for example, I might have provided them with a maximum of 10 or 15 points. That by itself, all of a sudden, I had 150, 200 students posting because they could get a few extra credit points. Uh, some correlational uh, results, again, showing that uh, if, you, if you use it by design, uh, there's a strong correlation between grades and amount of post, number of postings, amount of participation. If you simply use it as kind of a side thing going on in the classroom, it doesn't necessarily correlate significantly uh, with grades. Some of the uh, survey results that um, ITAP came up with, uh, they surveyed uh, quite a number of students, and this is their response relating to uh, some of the benefits 
They could see what other people were thinking in class, and especially when you're dealing with topics relating to same-sex marriage, cohabitation, things like that, they could actually see what others in the class were thinking. And again, the, the issue of not having to talk in front of hundreds of other students, again, this was something that they felt like hot seat gave them that option. Comment from a student. And I might comment on this, uh, sometimes in some of my classes I'll play a, a film clip and so it gives me the ability to get up, uh, start the clip and, and wander around the back of the classroom. And in some of our classrooms it's very easy to see what's going on uh, from the back of the room. And all of a sudden when we started using Hot Seat and posting a couple of topics for students to respond to, what I saw happening instead of seeing students on Facebook watching a video or doing something else, all of a sudden those screens uh, started changing to I was seeing the hot seat site on the screens and students were participating in hot seat rather than going to to other internet sites and and uh, social network sites So the bottom line is um, I felt like hot seat gave me the ability to find out from students not only what they know but what they thought about the topics that I wanted to discuss and this gave them a vehicle gave them a means it taps in with their proclivity for multitasking uh, it also top, taps into their proclivity for using technology and uh, I truly think hot seat really became a, a, a tool of engagement uh, instead of having uh, students who are just kind of not really with you during large lecture I was able to at least move them incrementally towards being in discussion engaged with me uh, on whatever the topic was for the day. So thank you. Well, good morning. Um, it, as uh, was mentioned earlier, it's a cold morning, but uh, those of us in forestry and natural resources, this would be uh, a welcome morning because it's not snowing and it's not raining and our students are, uh, are hopefully uh, uh, thoroughly engaged and, and not uh, just trying to keep dry. Um, I'm going to talk about a program that I've been, uh, I've been working with over the last year. Uh, it's an introduction to forestry class that's targeted at high school students. So it's one of Purdue's um, dual credit type classes. It's not, a, uh, it's not a complete dual credit class, but it's along that, uh, along that line. Um, My um, experience with uh, educational systems has been uh, at one point in the support and um, utility and integration of systems. It's, um, it's one thing to be uh, innovative and designing new systems, but when you find yourself in a production mode of just trying to get a class put together, it's often uh, what's available, what can, I, what can I package? And so I like to think of myself more in the packaging role than in the, uh, the innovative uh, new uh, programming line of things. The students that I deal with are, are, high, sc are high school students, uh, primarily uh, uh, seniors, hopefully, as we uh, uh, get more involvement in the program. Those students' um, portal to our program is through Blackboard, um, like it or not. That's our, uh, our course management system. And using that as a platform gives us some um, capability and also some limitations uh, that led me to uh, use different uh, technologies as a part of putting a class together in this environment. I've been using um, university supported software systems, uh, everywhere from, uh, from Banner, uh, uh, Student enrollment in the classes is, is done for me. I don't want to have to be involved in that, even though these are off-campus students. Uh, once again, I mentioned Blackboard Vista. I use uh, Adobe Connect, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I use Adobe Presenter, and I'll explain my uh, utility of that. Uh, obviously, I use the internal network and the career account servers with the students. 
Uh, the mail system, we'll talk uh, a little bit about that. I use the streamer, uh, the libraries and their databases, um, uh, the office suite that's supported uh, through the university. Uh, I use uh, presentations and our web page uh, at our department and the Purdue trademark. So what I want is the student who's coming to an online class to, to have a common portal to get into the class so they don't have to learn yet one more system, that things look familiar when they get in there and they can work their way through the course without being uh, confused. Uh, so when we look at, at information flow in the educational context, uh, there's me as the instructor to the learner. And so once again, my primary distribution link is, is Blackboard. Um, I use PowerPoint that's, that's content enhanced in that I use uh, narrations in the PowerPoint, I embed videos in the PowerPoint, I, I link to the, to, the, uh, to the streamer, and I use a fair amount of, of uh, web-based videos that are available to me. Discovery Channel, um, we have a forestry network of Southern Extension Stations that has a video library that I tie into, and so the students are expected to be able to tap into those links as well. Uh, my experience is if I can capture those videos and embed them in the PowerPoint, I'm better off than if I, uh, if I attempt to link directly through the web because inevitably the web links break or somebody doesn't support the site anymore and I have to go back and make corrections. And I use the traditional, the assignments and quizzes features of, of the online tools. When I'm looking for uh, instructor-learner interaction, um, I'm in now to uh, feedback and assessments. Um, I use, uh, I use quizzes in the system. I'm using primarily Blackboard quizzes, but I do have the ability to use quizzes uh, in Adobe Connect uh, as, as polling uh, type things. Um, the assignment tool for getting students to uh, contribute those assignments to me through a uh, controlled environment. Uh, I use online office hours where I use Adobe Connect. Um, and then I use, I use email. Uh, we talk a lot about social networking uh, uh, Facebook and those sorts of things, but it seems like these uh, these off-campus students um, they get into kind of a no business, you know, an all business mode. They it's they realize it's not a social uh, a social event; it's a learning thing, and so they're they're looking at how do I, uh, in a more rigorous fashion, deal with the instructor uh, and communicate with them. Um, one thing I found out early on, in especially some of our rural communities in the state, is uh, when I, when I ask the students to have a webcam on their end, the, uh, the parents think that's a porn cam. And so <laughs> it's, uh, you know, these are the issues that you deal with. And uh, like it or not, I have to you know, overcome those, those kind of things. So I had some students that only, uh, only uh, came in through audio. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're able to two-way communicate through the, through the cyber infrastructure. Uh, very quickly, the students uh, figured out that there was some learner-learner interaction that was involved. And these high school students um, very quickly figured out that they could pick up these other students in the class emails, and I mean, within a week they were they were communicating with each other in the class, trying to work out issues rather than go to me. So using peer-to-peer -peer kinds of things. Uh, I, when I created the class, Mixable wasn't available, but I can clearly see that Mixable is a positive that, that can be used in this environment. Um, some of the some of the Interactive tools in Blackboard, the discussion board, um, be frank, I kind of find it worthless. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I do use um, Adobe Connect, and, uh, and that ability to have that communication tool is, uh, is quite vital for these, uh, for these distance programs. Um, tech support. You can't develop these classes without, without fabulous tech support. And, um, the, the, the individuals at ITAP have been, have been incredibly valuable to me in being able to produce the course, keep it current, uh, work through the technical issues. Um, so that frontline response, which is almost instant in, in virtually every case that I've come across, has been invaluable. I've also used uh, folks at the, at the uh, Digital Learning Collaboratory in the Hicks Library um, for some of the video work that I've done in terms of understanding uh, various video format, formats and codexes and things that I have no interest in learning about have able, been able to work with me on getting video into the right place um, using the right tools. 
Um, I've also been able to use some student labor uh, to do videography for me, and that's been incredibly valuable as well. Um, uh, putting together custom videos in forestry where we've done uh, virtual field trips, uh, where we've, we've recorded those. Those are then available to our distant students in this forestry class. I think one of the most uh, invaluable tools in this packaging effort in developing a, an online course has been third-party tool recommendations. I don't have a lot of time to sit on the web and go through PC Magazine and figure out what the greatest gee whiz things are. Um, I can call folks at ITAP or at the collaboratory and I can say, I need to do this. What, what's a tool to do that? And so recommendations on things like, um, and I didn't realize things like this, was that there's a, 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 uh, an add-on to Firefox, it's called Video Helper, that allows you to just capture video. Bam, zip, it's right in there. It creates uh, a number of formats and then you can incorporate those in PowerPoint, publish it, and you have movies that the students can view. Um, I, I mentioned that I would talk a little bit about Presenter and, and how that's used. I, I use Presenter to publish my PowerPoints as PDFs. What I find is the students, if I, if I create PowerPoint with, reach, with rich media and if I do that with Presenter, they don't, they're not able to see the videos. And so issues that come up, you know, they're telling me, I've got the PowerPoint, but I can't watch the movie. Or the movie comes up and it freezes. And so I find that if I'm able to publish those videos in Presenter and primarily use Flash as the, as the issue, if I, need, if I need good quality video, I then link to the server, the streamer, and, and they can see the, the, the MOV files directly. Um, but some of the other suggestions that they've given me are things like Quick Media Converter. I mean, these are things that I, as a forester, had you know, very limited knowledge on how to do these things. So, so the, the ability to have someone on site to make those recommendations is, is invaluable. And that especially comes in terms of the hardware. Um, now, I have, I have students that are not on campus. I, don't, I can't go over to their machine and see what's going on. So what I'm having to do then is, is troubleshoot the first weeks in class. And so I end up spending you know, a week or two before the class finally can get rolling because of issues like I can't see their camera. And, and so I'm trying to communicate with them, what did you do? Try this, reboot, restart the thing, and, and we go back and forth and back and forth and finally get things going. So having recommendations on hardware that those students need and the software that they need is invaluable. Things like QuickTime Player, uh, latest version of Flash Player, Java. So these are students that are out in the hinterlands and I have a tech sheet that I give them and I say, you need to load these things on your machine. Well, it turns out they don't have administrator privileges and they, you know, and so you end up having to, to go through all these things. But, but, the, uh, but the key take home message that I like to give you is the resources at ITAP are invaluable. And if you're going to be doing online programs that are, that are distance-based, these, these individuals are, are on your auto-dialer because it's that important to get the technology worked out. Our students don't want to have to fumble through technology to take a class at Purdue. So that's my message, so thank you. Good morning. I have a very easy task, presenting the easiest software you can learn. Uh, how many, let me just start, how many of you have used Signals? Oh, not many. I'm surprised. You will see. It's an it's, uh, easy one. Let me see. All right, okay. Uh, basically, Provost just mentioned about the signals and has been commercialized. Yeah. And I don't know whether that will be better, but I can share with you my experience. Uh, signals is generated, or we call data mining. Uh, and data come from the Blackboard gradebook which is performance, and also the activity involved in the Blackboard. How's that, how that happened, I don't know. I think John Campbell knows. <laughs> and in terms of where to go to access it, uh, again, ITAP has a great support. When I have questions, it seems like dumb. I just send an email or a call, and I got help. Basically, some glad, before you log into Blackboard, uh, there's a tab, it's called Faculty and Staff. Just click on that, scroll it down, you will see it. 
And the first time, if you want to, just click on the link, submit a request, very easy. Click it, then set it up or link to your Blackboard. Uh, once it's linked to your Blackboard, click on access, then you can start. Uh, this is how it looks in my Blackboard in the Teach tab. You will see the signal once it's set up. Very easy, I don't need to do anything. Uh, I should correct. I probably need to send a link to my home page to show it. I think I did. It's so natural, I don't even have to remember. And then when I'm ready to run a call intervention, that means to generate something to create a signal for the student. So once you're in, click on Get Started. This is just showing you what you can do once you're inside. You can, uh, there's an email in signals. When you're ready to send a signal to student, you can customize, add it. There's a template, you just added, added some message and send it to the student. Uh, this is, I have two courses. You can submit any courses you want and this is the current course I have. So I'm ready, I choose one of the course and then run. There's uh, this prompt basically guide you through what you do. You don't have to really talk anything, just guide one step at a time, click, click, click. And after I run the intervention, uh, you can see some colors. And each student you may see, and I have set some criteria and I'll show you. This is a criteria I set, you can customize it. Uh, the way I see green light, I told the student at the beginning, 90 above, you get a green light. Uh, 80 and 89 is uh, yellow, below 79 you got a red light, it's time for help. So I told the student at the beginning. Uh, that is the signals in, in this blackboard, it's not the actual reflection of their grade, okay? Because if you look at this, this first slide talking about that three circle, uh, it involves about blackboard activity. So the signal is not the actual grade, and I mentioned that to students. Um, and then there's another screen set. You can decide the time frame. And my personally, I always start from the beginning of semester up to that day. And this is just an example to show you. At the beginning, I run the intervention and some light changes. We have green light and some are changed from, uh, some maintain in red and some turn into green. And my experience is, uh, again, it's very easy, but uh, one thing about the email, the first time when I use it, I didn't quite understand about Blackboard uh, usage. So the template is basically encourage them to uh, either congratulate for the green light, they're excellent and continue to keep up the good work, or yellow light says something, uh, yellow or and red light says something about they need to ask for help or provide some resources. So I added a little bit, but I didn't quite get it about the Blackboard usage. So I send it. The email basically once it's edited, you can just click and send. Everybody get it automatically. Some students say, what do you mean about Blackboard usage? <laughs> uh, so the second time when I use it, I just added, delete that one. Um, but again, uh, this is something about the student, if they get some message, they don't quite get it through email, they will send an email, ask me, uh, ask for questions. Talking about email, I do have some student with a uh, problem, either yellow or, or red, and make sure my standardized message will say, come to ask for help. And I provide uh, uh, my uh, the way to, to reach me. And some students do come to either make appointment or uh, talk with me before or after class. Uh, I constantly getting uh, email, even though I told the student at the beginning that signal is just signal, it's not actual grade, but I keep getting it. It seems like one year in, one year out. Um, keep getting it, it says, is, I got green light, that means I'm A student, right? I'm A for this course. I said, no, checking your I gave them a great worksheet. It's uh, built by Excel because each assignment, each activity has different point, uh, percentage grade. So I asked them to track with Excel to figure out their grade. But again, just not everybody can get that message until they actually see their grade. So that's the thing, the limitation of signal, but I see that's a strength. Um, especially when the students see the color change, they're happy 
and I do see some motivation there. I don't have research data to show. Um, so that's basically, I, was, I, I would encourage it. It's good. You can run as many times as you want to. It's easy. Just click, 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 and go. Uh, definitely, you do have to have something in the grade book to show something. So I don't run that. At the, I, so far, I still run it at the midterm. I have not really started earlier than midterm. Even though it's recommended to run the intervention early, uh, probably if I have more heavy duty assignment, I don't run it just for quiz. Probably I should. Okay. All right, that's all. Good morning. Uh, I'll have to say that I don't have any research on this. I'm kind of a novice. So one of my roles in the College of Technology is that I, um, I like to encourage my faculty to use new technologies and try new things. Uh, I'll have to admit, when I first got here, I'd been using Blackboard at Arizona State for many years, and we were using Vista here, Web Vista. So I was really trying to encourage people to use it, and I got a lot of backlash, <laughs> a lot of backlash. So I thought, well, I better use it myself. And I found out that the Web Vista was, really wasn't the easiest thing to use. And as we're moving into Blackboard, we're finding that things are, are much more intuitive for us. Well, I, I'm, we're starting a core curriculum in the College of Technology, and I said, I think we need to use clicker technology in there. And they looked at me. And I said, and I'm going to use it in my class this fall. <laughs> so I contacted ITAP, and I said, I need to, I need to use iClickers because I need to be able to talk with them and explain that it's really a good thing. So I used iClickers in a freshman level class, uh, this uh, CGT 111, Designing for Visualization and Communication, 80 students. So not a huge class, but certainly larger than a uh, 20, sec 20 or 22 student class. So um, I contacted ITAP, and uh, it just so happened that one of the, um, one of the people that worked with us was one of my former students, and she came over and she said, Dr. St Sadowski, there's a couple different kinds, but you're going to use the iClear because I know that's what you'll like the best. Okay, so that's what we did. So, do all of you have your eye clicker with you? Okay, so, don't do anything yet. Don't do anything yet. All right, so the eye clicker is, I use the eye clicker for a lot of things. I use it for attendance, I use it for quizzes, I use it for interaction, I use it for discussion. So right now, I'm going to use it to get started with you. Now, before we do anything, let me tell you what happens if you're going to use the eye clicker. Well, first, let, let's find. Let's do this first. Let's let's do a question here. So the first thing you have to do is turn your eye clicker on so that the blue light shows. And before you can answer this question, I have to turn it on. And if you notice up there in the left-hand corner, and the students are really good at pointing out, Dr. Sadowski forgot to turn it on today. I have to go back and turn it on. All right. So I'm going to turn it on, and it says start. Now you can give me an answer. So you click A, B, C, D, or E. And if you don't like your answer, you can click again because it will, it will register the very last answer. So there must be about 35, 36 of us in here. All right. Everybody has answered. We're going to stop. 37. So now I know that we've had 37 people that have answered this question. So let's have a look and see what your answers were. Hmm. Well. So now I'm using this to gather a little demographics here. So I know that 13% of you are already using iClicker technology, but you may not be using, well, you're using clicker technology, may not be the iClicker. 34% of you are thinking about using it. 36% have never heard of clicker technology. 18% don't use this newfangled stuff. And E is I'm afraid to use it because for whatever reason. All right. So this is how I use this in my class. And so I would start with this. And I would tell you a few things about iClicker. So let's get started about what you have to do. If you're going to use these, uh, iTap will come over with a bundle. And they'll set you up in your classroom. So you can see this little mobile, mobile thing right here. I carry this with me to every class. All right, I have a bag. I've got my iClicker in it. I've got my things with it. And I've got this. And so far, in uh, 14 and a half weeks, I have one more class. I have never forgotten to take it to class or bring it back with me, which I should have my name on it because I'm always concerned about this. So one of the things you have to do is you plug this in as you're starting it up, and you have to go to the iClicker site, takes a couple clicks, turn it on, and make sure that's, that you've got this thing in the left-hand corner. If you don't, 
you aren't going to be able to do it, and the kids are sitting there going, oh, she forgot again. It takes, takes just a minute to get there, all right? So we can turn this off, and we're going to go on. This, this right here, well, let's, I'll continue with what I'm talking. I'm going to move on here, and so I'm going to give you another quiz. All right, so I'd like you to give me an answer to this one. Which of these is true about clicker technology? All right, 39 people have answered. Let's stop. And I have to tell you, I sent this over yesterday. I've been traveling a lot since Thanksgiving. So I got home, got back yesterday, and I was putting this together because I wanted to do a little bit of a demo. And uh, when I got here, the ITEP people were going, what are you talking about? ITEP, it's difficult to work with. Well, what is the real answer to this? Well, let's have a look here. All right, 13% of you said it's too expensive. Uh, B said it's really complicated. C said, uh, let's see here. 41% of you said that students often forget to bring their clicker. Only 5% said that ITAP is difficult to work with. Okay, so you got 95% of the people are liking ITAP right now. And E said none, uh, 41 of you said none of the above. Well, if I'm looking at this, oh, and I forgot to show you how I can do this. If I'm looking at this, I would probably say that, uh, let's see here, I gotta go back to my, my mouse here. I got lost, all right. I'm, I'm doing this with a Mac. I don't know how to do I use a Mac all the time, but I've never used one here. I don't know how to do it from here. Did my mouth, does this mouth work? Can I use this? Yes. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. All right. It's a laptop, a little bit different. All right, so I would say that the correct answer is E. So that's what I'm going to click. All right. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to collect this information in Blackboard. And on the last one, I didn't collect it. So I have to go back and do it. I can set that manually. But here I've set that I say the correct answer is E, even though not everybody agreed with me. So in this particular case, let's turn this off, and this is what I want to talk about. So what this does for me is this works all through Blackboard. As I collect this data, and when I then take, there's a, a little jump drive here, a thumb drive that I can take and put into my computer, and now I can put all these scores into Blackboard. I can pull them up, and I can find out what the correct answers are. And I have to tell you, throughout 15 weeks, there's been a couple answers that there was no actual correct answer. Um, or there was more than one correct answer. And so sometimes I had to go back and manually make those corrections. In this case, green. The answer to this is none of the above, I think. No, it isn't either. What is the answer here? I don't even know what we've got here. I've got to close it down here. Okay, well, this was an opinion. So I gave a correct answer, although there wasn't. So I'm going to talk about this. Um, got to go to the next one. All right, in this case, we said that none of the above. So it's too expensive for the students. It costs about $30, $35 for them to buy this iClicker. So there's a couple things about this. In my college, I know that the physics and chemistry teachers are using these iClickers. They only got to buy one. I also know that if someone else in the college or their buddy or their roommate used this, they can use somebody else's. So it doesn't mean that once they've registered that nobody else can have it. So there's a little number on the back, and all they have to do is register that number with your class, and it automatically works into Blackboard. It's complicated to learn. I got to tell you, it's not. It's very, very easy to, easy to learn how to use, although I was a little nervous. The first week, I didn't count the points simply because not everybody had their eye clickers. They forgot to turn them on. They didn't have the batteries in. These are first-semester freshmen. Uh, students often forget to bring their clicker. A bunch of you said that was an answer. I have not found that to be true. Very rarely. In fact, I have students that forget to bring a pencil and a paper, but they have their eye clicker. They have it with them. Now, there is every so often someone will come up to me and say, oh, I forgot my eye clicker, the battery broke, it dropped on the floor, whatever happened. So basically what I have them do is send me an email, tell me what the question was and what your answer was, and then I can manually put those points in. And amazingly enough, all of those students that have to email it, they got them right. They got the correct answers. Uh, ITAP is difficult to work with. That is definitely not true. They have been absolutely great. Whenever I've had, an, had a question, I send an email out and I get a response right away. And uh, this was new to me and they 
treated me so nice. I, I would ask questions that now I look back and go, oh, yeah, I knew they told me how to do that, and I just forgot. They just keep working with you. So this is definitely a none of the above. All of these things are easy to use. Okay, so let's do another quiz. Which of the following can be done with clicker technology? Okay, let's have a look at your answers. Wow, this is pretty good. 92% of you said all of the above, and that is, in fact, the correct answer. So we would go in here and click E, and now that would be the correct answer. So I take attendance with it, but I don't take attendance by saying, are you here or are you not here? I actually do it with a quiz. So I quiz the students two or three times throughout the class within my PowerPoint slides. So the very, the, the slide that happens after the introduction slide is always an eye clicker quiz. And I got to tell you, no one is ever late to my class. They are right there. And no one ever leaves because I always give one at the very end. And then a couple in the middle. So I will ask them questions about the reading. I will ask them questions about the lecture that I just did the day before. I might ask them questions at the end. I might ask them something about what I just talked about. Uh, so there are mul usually multiple choice, uh, multiple choice questions. Um, so the way I work it with iClicker, uh, I can do a couple different things. I can give them an attendance point if they just answer it. So the way I work it out is that if they answer all of the questions, they get one point. If they answer the questions right, they get an additional point for every one they got right. So on this, let's say I did four questions in any given day maybe four. So if they answered all four of them, they got one point for, getting, for answering them all, and if they got all four questions right, they would actually get five points. That doesn't happen very often. They might get three or four. And I, I do give them points for this. Out of my um, about 1,200 points, and they get 50 points. They can get up to 50 points, and that's on a percentage basis. The first couple of weeks, they toyed with me until I re reminded them they were actually getting points because it was kind of fun to not get them all right. Um, so I do give these mini quizzes throughout. Uh, we can spark discussion. I'm going to give you an example of that. We can ask, you can set things up in advance, which I do, but if I've got two or three things uh, up on my PowerPoint and I want to talk about at which one do you like the best or which one is right or wrong, we can just do that automatically because what you get back from, uh, from the iClicker uh, software is that you get a, a screen capture of whatever it was you were talking about at that time. So you can do a series of things and then you can choose to count, not count the discussion questions or, and just count the quiz questions. I, I love this because I carry this around. I walk up and down the aisle and I advance with this eye clicker. I don't have to have anything else. It, you know, I'm hoping the next version will have a laser pointer because I have to carry around, this is in my pocket, I have a, a little mouse tool which is a laser, laser pointer which is actually a cat toy. And I'm always telling the kids I've got my mouse and then when I hand it to them to use it, they go, it really is a mouse, but I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get a laser pointer in there. So, this is, so we, this is what I use them for. And this is an example of something where I might use to uh, spark a discussion. So here we have this, and I always explain this as, you know, taking my nephew to Barbados for his, his graduation from high school trip. And this is his first day ever at the ocean on the beach. So I asked them, I might, I might do an eye clicker quiz, and I might say to them, which one of these would you use to, um, if you were selling sunglasses? This is a, this is a, a visual course we're talking about. So so then so we would then go through it and click on these answers, and then we talk about why one of these might be better than the other if I were selling sunglasses. Well, which one might you use if you just wanted to show pure joy? Well, it might be it might be C because I can really see his face. Which one would you use if you wanted to talk about if you were selling the clear sandy or the, the clear clean water? Well, you might want it to be A. Which one if you want to talk about the broad expanse of beaches? Well, it might be D. So we can kind of go through these. We put these up and we can see how they voted. And then we can talk about, okay, so if you picked C, why? 
And believe me, as soon as they've got this, they're ready to talk. And so we get so much more, I get so much more interaction with these students. They love using this technology. Going on here, this is just an example of one that I would have used in my class. This came from a lecture or from the reading, and this would be a type of quiz question that I'm asking them. So you can see I'm asking them quiz questions that I think that they need to know. So I am giving them points for this, and they're taking it seriously. Uh, I have to tell you that I, um, I had a, a professor in the class before me who had just given a very short quiz and had the little bubble sheets with four or five answers to it. And I said, you know, you could do this with the clicker. He goes, well, you know, I don't really know what that is. I said, well, I said, I'm going to use one right at the very beginning of my class. So why don't you just stick around? So he sat in the front row and we went through the quiz and we had about 84% right. We're always trying to get 100%. We had about 84%. And I stepped forward to talk to this, two minutes, that's good, to talk to this professor and say, uh, to tell him how we used it. And he, he kind of looked behind me, and I looked behind, and son of a gun, we'd gotten all the way to 100%. So I'd forgotten to turn it off. And while I was doing that, the student said, wait, I know what they, because I had already showed the right answer. Uh, so, <laughs> and then they cheered. They cheered. We got 100%. So today is my last class. And um, because I, we do a lot of projects in there, I don't have a final exam. We've done three tests, and we have a final project that's due next week. And I said, well, I've got some stuff I really want to talk to you about. I said, so I would consider adding some extra eye clicker quizzes into the lecture. They're, oh, that'd be good. That'd be good. We'll be there. Uh, so this has, this has been a good thing for me. Um, I have two minutes, and I'm ending right there. I would just stop by saying that... Um, I use this with 80 students. I think you could use it with, I know in physics they use it with larger lectures. I find it to actually be fun. It's a challenge for me to come up with things. Uh, the students like it, and they bring those clickers. Uh, every once in a while the batteries die. I actually carry some extra batteries around with just in case. But I find it a, an interesting way to teach and get interaction with students in a larger than, a, if there's 20 students, I can interact with them easily. When there's 80 or more, I find that something like this, which is easy to use, it's not cumbersome, um, and has worked very well for me. So thank you. I just had a question about the eye clicker thing because I know I have two kids in Purdue and one of them's used it a lot. And they're, how do the students get any kind of feedback initially when they're trying to get it set up to make sure that they're actually registering themselves? <laughs> um, because I know she went a whole week of getting no credit for anything she did because it wasn't logging it on her. Well, basically, account. as a professor, I went back to the students and I looked to see who had, and, and in the uh, log, it shows you which ones are connected and which ones aren't. So it, you actually have the information, it's just not connected to their account. So what I did is, and I sent an email to all the students who had not registered or didn't show that has, had registered until they got it done. So even if it's not registered in that first week, when they finally do get it registered, it will sync with their account so they don't lose those points. Uh, this has been a very interesting discussion. Um, I'm wondering, uh, since you have uh, adopted these technologies and um, brought them into your teaching, what else, what new, what's the next, uh, next big thing that you'd like to do with technology? I, I thought it was intriguing how many of us are learning about our students with technology. And I think what I'd like to do, um, I was interested in Ralph's wanting to know, uh, have someone advise him about what to use. How can we network among faculty um, to make our work more efficient and to make it more explicit what we can be learning about our students that can then turn around and improve our teaching. Uh, I, I get the feeling that what we're doing at Purdue is not yet um, viewed as scholarly activity, and yet I think it really has potential to be scholarly activity. So here we are, and I'm sure there you are. It would be wonderful to see groups of faculty turning this into a more scholarly endeavor. I would like to say I really enjoy this presentation and learn a lot from uh, the presenters. 
uh, one thing is, I wish this online community can share because look at how many people attended, how many people are not able to attend. So that's one thing I like to see some, not like Facebook, okay, but something we can really share online, learn from each other presentation. I know this presentation will probably will be loaded. Um, another thing is related to iClicker. I raised a question yesterday. Uh, because I know a lot of times you use the freshman level, but then later on you don't use it. Uh, this technology, I plan to use it next semester, and I did the investigation. Web base is cheaper, one semester only $10, and that can be used for any courses once they register, and they don't have another device to carry cell phone, laptop, uh, smartphone, whatever. Okay? Um, so that is something I hope we can figure out ways faculty can collaborate online. And you can really, once it's actually, it's easy to upload, once you have the iClicker thing or either web-based or the, the devices, you can upload your score to Blackboard easily. Your question is, is new technologies. And one stumbling block that I came across was the ability to do live video feed from a lab without the students being there. And uh, apparently right now, we don't quite have that ability to do the, the video without bringing in like a satellite truck uh, to, the, to the woods. You, you, I mean, I can't, I can't do that live. So what I'm having to do currently is record the video, download it using a, um, uh, a, a wireless uh, plug in the laptop in the woods. Then I can, I can pipe it out through the, through the server. So that technology, I think, would add a, a, a bit of spice to, uh, dis especially to those distance people who can't go to, to the lab. I had a very interesting experience last uh, spring. <clears throat> McGraw-Hill, the publisher, invited about a dozen of us down to Florida uh, to spend an extra, extra long weekend and brainstorm uh, this type of thing of, of what they as a publisher uh, could, could develop and help instructors in the classroom. And in talking with some of these um, kind of visionary type instructors from all over the United States, it was really fascinating because we came from Alabama and, and Washington State and Indiana and everywhere, and we were all on the same page about what we really would like to see next generation of tools that come from the publisher. And what, what we described to them was basically, if we adopt your textbook, especially in large lectures, then you would give us everything we need to instruct that class except for stuff involving maybe the most recent research and things like that. Uh, you'd provide us with the tools to, you know, conduct lecture, uh, do quizzes, especially online type stuff. But the most fascinating part of it, what we asked for was the ability to assess and connect learning to assessment directly and give direct feedback to the student. And one of the things they kind of showed us in a, in a prototype, and the imagery I think really pictures best what they showed us they were working on, was every student's course site for that particular course would have a tree. And as they mastered content in chapter one, then chapter two, and then chapter three, and then chapter four, it would add foliage to the tree until so theoretically by the end of the semester, if they had mastered 100% of the content, their tree would be filled in with 100% of the foliage. If they mastered 50%, their tree would have, have half their leaves present, half their leaves missing. Now, what was fascinating about that, we did that spring break of last year, gave them that feedback. Um, I had a, a McGraw-Hill representative in my office a few weeks ago who showed me the site that I could adopt next fall semester if I wanted for my course that would do exactly what we described uh, to, to, to them back in the spring. So I see that as the next generation and especially that piece of connecting not just new technology but linking it to assessment of learning and documenting what the students really are learning uh, in the class or 
whatever, whatever pedagogies, whatever we're doing, that there, we can actually document learnings taking place. So I see that as the next, as the next step. And I would just say, uh, the thing that's starting to happen now more and more as you're putting new courses together and old courses, are working with publishers that will literally pull pieces and parts together. So we're putting together a core curriculum and we're working with a publisher who said, okay, anything that we have or someplace else, we'll pull it together and we will have it for the students either online or they can buy the print or they can buy pieces and parts so that instead of having to have a book and be stuck with a book, we can literally build the information that we think these students need to have for that course. And that's getting better and better. It's not perfect, but it's getting better. And they have sites where they'll add video and all kinds of things for it. So I think that's really promising. But I do think that in a forum like this, um, we need to also think how much of what we view as learning in the next 10 years is going to be content delivery. And what are the implications from the cyber infrastructure group, which is changing how people work together? What are the implications for changing uh, what we do at the undergraduate level. And um, textbook publishers are not going to lead the way there. I think that has to be us. How, how many boxes are Purdue students carrying around with them to their different classes nowadays? My, I'm in nursing. I, my, my students are taking chemistry courses, and that's a big class. And then I think a lot of chemistry courses are using it. I don't know the number. Probably more than 500 students. You probably know, Amy. How many, how many different items are students, say, carrying around with them? Oh, different items. The hard, hard hardware. Talking about another thing why I like the web-based, because the, this current one, I, I, I'm currently using the CPS, which is, uh, has a little LCD display stuff. It's more versatile than this one, two, three, four. But if it's web-based, I have a lot more choice. And then you have one less device to carry. <laughs> Through the phones? That, uh, I guess phones and laptops are pretty it's common now. Is that the direction that we're taking in terms of having these tools in the students' hands in the class? That's what I hope, so, hope for, but it really depends on the student. By this or not, depends on the faculty. If faculty say you must have, and the faculty do not want to use West based, then students have to buy it. So we have to convince the faculty to do so. Uh, I don't know if I don't know administrator can tell faculty what to do. 